Okay, good morning and thank you all for your patience. Uh, we made it to the last webinar before having a small technical glitch as the final hurdle. Um, but thankfully, I can see quite a lot of you joining us now and it's great to have you with us for the final session today. Um, so we thought it fitting with our last session to welcome um, back some representatives from ISME and from Griffith uh, to round off our seminar. So before we get to um, the session with Jim Power and Justin Keoghan, which I'll tell you all about in a few moments, I am delighted to welcome um, Adam Weatherly, Learning and Development Manager with ISME, and Dr. Tomas McOkagon, Director of Academic Programs from Griffith College, who are going to say just a few words to you this morning before we begin our strategy session. Um, so Adam, I'll come to you first, if you don't mind, and welcome to our webinar series. I know you've been joining us as an attendee on quite a number of days. Yes, sorry, I'm just getting my video started. Here we go. Thank you, Eilish. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to, uh, to get to this point. Um, it's been a bit of a whirlwind in, in getting this program up and running, and we're delighted uh, to be uh, uh, involved in this. Um, and uh, to get to this point, and I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, to say thank you to a few people, but also to announce some further good news. Uh, and good news in the current environment, I think, is always welcome. So we've been absolutely delighted with the engagement uh, of SMEs across the country with this program, the Recovery and Rethink Your Strategy. In particular, I'd, I'd like to thank Griffith College. Um, they've been absolutely exceptional. The generosity of providing the technology platforms, the lecturers, the speakers, the facilitators, all free of charge for this vital program. Um, of particular note also, Eilish, thank you to you and your team. Uh, you have been an excellent facilitator. Um, so I'd like to say thank you for all the behind the scenes work that, we, that people don't see that goes on uh, and your calm demeanor whilst hosting over a thousand people who tune in uh, to each webinar each week. Uh, a, a, a particular webinar that I enjoyed that resonated with, with me was uh, Por, uh, Podrick O'Kady's um, transformation and innovation presentation. Uh, it resonated with me because we had to change our business model literally overnight and I certainly learned an awful lot from those two hours, two hours well spent. So the good news, um, we have received some emergency funding, if I can call it that, uh, from Skillnet Ireland. Um, this takes us to phase two of this program. Um, it's, uh, this, this next phase is about getting your plan, your ideas, um, your, strategy, your new strategy for your business implemented uh, in the best possible way to help us all recover. Um, the, it, it's 100% funding that we're offering, so there will be no charge to you guys. Um, it doesn't matter what you're looking at or what you're thinking about doing with your business. It doesn't matter what part, whether it's a, a particular part of your business that you want to improve or change, or whether it's a new product, a new service, or even a new market that you're looking at. We would like to help you with that. Now, the, fun, the funding is it's not, it's not a limitless fund, but it's healthy enough to help a good many of you. And we would be delighted to hear from you and delighted to continue to help you create, devise, implement whatever you are trying to do. So I'd be delighted to hear from you personally. I have a very easy email address and my contact details will be provided to you at the end of the, this webinar but it's adam at isme.ie. I'd be delighted to hear from you. So please get in touch. This is about Ireland Inc. It's about getting Ireland back up and running when this uh, dreadful pandemic dis uh, hopefully disappears. Uh, it's about making, helping you make courageous business decisions. So thank you uh, for tuning in each week. Um, we hope that we have helped you in some way. I'd like to hand you over to Tomas now, um, who also has um, some further good news. So Tomas, good morning. Uh, nice to see you again. Hello. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Eilish. I'm coming from Griffith College. Well, at least that's the background anyway to this picture. 
but like everybody else, I'm in my own home and just in, in a room coming to your life. I want to say a few things. It has been an enormous privilege for Griffith College, for me personally, for everybody on the team to have been associated with this is me GC series. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'd like to thank Adam and also Jim Power, who's speaking there today. It's really remarkable that just a few weeks ago, maybe six, seven weeks ago, we just sat maybe less than that. And we said, what could we do? What would make sense? Would we try something? And we decided to give a series a go. Everybody standing in, everybody doing it for free and say, what would be the most useful thing to do? I'd like to thank Jim for being the first person to say, yeah, count me in, I'd be there. And I wish him every success today. I'd like to thank Eilish and her team and all the contributors internally and externally in the college who made this possible, who gave their time, who reimagined what was necessary, redrafted everything and said, what do we think would work? So the huge team behind there, Eilish, Michael and all the team. I'd like to thank the marketing teams and the technical teams in Griffith College and in ISME who put the word out and made it possible to promote the course and let people know. But more than anything else, I want to thank you. Thank you all, the business managers and owners who tuned in for the sessions live or watched them on recording for taking the time and trusting that there might be something there of value. I really, really hope that some of the sessions somewhere helped you in some way to rethink or to reimagine or to just think about where you're going. I'd like to give huge congratulations to Adam on the most recent development, the opportunity to provide funding, support, a sounding board, mentoring support for people who want to take their business development plans further. Hugely, hugely helpful to have a friend, an informed other who'd say, I mean, is this mad? Is this right? Does this make sense? Is this good? Just that sounding board, that independent, useful sounding board. So I wish Adam and all the team every success with that. For our part, we'd like to add to that. And we envisaged this all along when we chatted some weeks ago with Jim and Adam. And that is that the college has a certificate in SME management, a certificate in small and medium enterprise management that's nationally accredited. And we would like to offer that certification and that qualification for free to anybody who'd like to do that. What's involved is to take the business development plan that you have and submit it to the college for consideration. The program typically takes what we say 250 hours of learning effort. And that's a 40 hour week for the last six weeks. There's nobody listening today that hasn't spent every minute of the last six weeks thinking, reimagining and redeveloping their business. So when you have your development plans together with Adam's support and the others and those sounding boards, think about maybe submitting them for consideration for a nationally accredited award. We've mentioned and communicated this with QQI, our partners, the National Accreditation Body, and they're delighted, delighted to facilitate this opportunity if it's of interest to you. So to reach us, like Adam, I have a fairly simple email. My name is Tomas Mokokogon, so nobody knows the surname. So my email is Tomas, T-O-M-A-S, no H and no father, just T-O-M-A-S at griffith.ie. Or you can contact Eilish or any of the team in Griffith, just find us if you'd like to actually take your plans once it's developed forward to certification. So finally, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time out of your lives, deciding who gets the broadband use in your home today, whether it's for school or if it's a partner or whatever, or when you're tuning in live or later. Thank you for taking the time to tune in. Look after yourself, your family, your business. 
we look forward to your businesses blooming again. We're a business ourselves, just as is me and Griffith are businesses. We too are going through some of these challenges, but we're in it together and we intend to stay in it together. So we wish you every success. Stay safe and well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Tomas. And thank you, Adam, as well. Great to have you with us. Um, I think it's nice and, and fitting that we, we'd have an, an official goodbye um, to our participants from, um, from both organisations. So thanks very much. Um, I think you two are going to leave us now and possibly rejoin as attendees. Um, so we thank you very much for your contributions. Um, and we'll move thank on. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to our final session, um, which quite fittingly from what Tomas and Adam have just told us with that great news for, for next steps. And I, I'll come back to that at the end of today's session too. But today's webinar is looking at strategy. Um, and we have two great speakers with us today. And um, so we're delighted to welcome Jim Powers. Tomas said he was the first person to raise his hand and say, how can I help? Absolutely count me in. Um, so Jim is one of Ireland's most widely regarded economists. Um, you may know him from his numerous media contributions and, and columns um, and so on. He is an author, a lecturer, um, a, a man of many talents. Um, so thank you, Jim, for being with us. Jim is going to look today at the economic conditions um, facing us post-COVID um, with a view to facilitating strat strategy planning for SMEs. And that's going to be followed by Justin. Justin Keoghan is a, a colleague of mine in the Graduate Business School, one of our most prolific lecturers um, in Griffith College. I think it's fair to say. Um, he, he's also um, a consultant and he also works as a corporate trainer as well. So Justin's going to bring us through a more practical um, uh, session then on strategy planning for your own business. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Jim and say thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much Eilish. Thanks very much to Moss and Adam for the kind words earlier. Um, Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this session. Over the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to take you through the macroeconomic background out there. Um, I'll give you some you know, feel for where I think things are likely to go over the next uh, short term, medium term, and hopefully it will fit into what Justin is going to talk about in terms of um, strategy, direction and planning and so on a little bit later on. Um, I suppose the, the first thing, yeah, okay, um, the, you know, co coming in 2019 was a challenging year for the world economy. Um, it delivered the lowest rate of growth since 2007, 2008. Coming into 2020, we were, well, certainly I was more optimistic about the coming year because a lot of the issues that um, hampered global growth last year, revolved around Donald Trump and his trade dispute with China and so on. And I believe coming into 2020 that he would back off that trade war with China simply because he has a presidential election to fight in November. And going into that against the background of economic difficulties caused by a trade war would not be a good thing to do. And true to form, in the early days of January, he started to back down, the Chinese became more conciliatory, and suddenly the whole threat of an all-out global trade war um, dissipated. Um, we also had the situation where you know, Britain avoided a crash out Brexit at the end of January, so that was also likely to give rise to a little bit of a post-Brexit bounce back in the UK and in Ireland, uh, and indeed from a European economy perspective. So, Two months into 2020, um, it was going to plan. You know, the world economy was looking um, reasonably good, not dramatic, but it was looking reasonably good. And then in the late February, early March, as you know, we were hit with this unprecedented shock in the shape of COVID-19. Um, we've seen basically large swathes of the global economy shut down. Service sector activities have been hit most aggressively. Uh, but I think every element of the economy and every economy has been undermined to some extent. The International Monetary Fund has warned that this could be the sharpest economic slowdown since the 1920s. Um, and when you see what's happening at the moment, you know, an extra 26 million people 
signing on for unemployment in the United States over the last five weeks. Uh, we see here in Ireland, you know, the over a million people now in some sort of state support um, for unemployment assistance and so on. And I could go on and on and I won't, but the, the, the magnitude of the crash we've seen in economic activity is pretty phenomenal. You know, there's no doubt about that. Um, policymakers have re reacted very, very aggressively. Uh, we've seen interest rates everywhere taken down to zero or virtually zero. We've seen central banks announce an ongoing increases in significant packages of bond buying or quantitative easing and other ways of providing liquidity, particularly into the banking systems around the world. We've seen governments virtually everywhere um, agreeing to implement massive packages of fiscal measures as in tax cuts, well, mainly expenditure increases. Um, and on average, the fiscal packages around the world announced are close enough to 10% of GDP, which is a pretty phenomenal response. So you could certainly say in a nutshell, global policymakers are recognizing to varying degrees the magnitude of the problems that are going down at the moment. We're seeing basically the kitchen sink now being thrown at those issues. Um, Europe, as always, was slower to come to the plate uh, because one of the problems with European policymaking is the difficulty in trying to get consensus on anything. Um, and ultimately what we normally get is a watered down compromise. And that's been the way over the last six or seven weeks. But Europe is gradually stepping up to the plate. You know, the EU fiscal rules have been relaxed. There is a recognition that every country in the European Union and indeed every country in the world basically will have to run significantly higher fiscal deficits and run up higher levels of government debt for the foreseeable future. Um, basically, the rules of engagement are being torn up. And I think that is the correct response because when you're hit with a shock of this magnitude, when you see businesses around the world, um, including in this country, being brought to their knees through absolutely no fault of their own, you know, it is only right that policymakers would step in and governments, central banks, with a massive policy response. And that's what we are seeing we will see a lot more of it. Um, talking about the recovery path, um, you know, the, the problem we have here is that back in 2007, 2008, you know, it was reasonably obvious what needed to be done. You know, banking systems needed to be brought back to a state of health. Certain things had to be done, all of which kind of you, you could describe as fundamental economic policies. Unfortunately, this time around, the, um, there's a lot less transparency in terms of how we're going to emerge from this. And the reason for that is because the recovery will depend on the path of the virus. Um, and we're already starting to see um, a number of economies, China started, Japan then, South Korea. Um, gradually, we're seeing it in Europe. We will see it in Ireland over the coming um, weeks, gradually starting to open up. Um, parts of their economies in a safe way. And this is the massive challenge, you know, for, until a vaccine is actually developed. Um, how you balance the, the necessity of helping business, helping economies um, against the, the risks to human health. So it, it is a pretty unprecedented challenge that governments and policymakers have at the moment. And we've seen, for example, in the north of Japan, where you know all of the well, a lot of the restrictions were gradually reduced over the last few weeks. There's another outbreak of the virus there, so that's now necessitating further shutting down of parts of the economy. And unfortunately, until a vaccine is developed, that's going to be the way of it over the next 12, 18 months, however long it takes. Because when you get um, an, an outbreak policymakers will have to come in and stamp down on it again to bring it back under control. You then reopen again. And I, I think that's the nature of it. There's a view out there that, you know, you open up an economy and then you're forced to shut it down again would absolutely destroy confidence. But I think we have to be realistic. That is likely, that is likely what's going to happen over the next 12, 18 months. You know, there will be periods of setback. There will be periods of 
um, locking down parts of economies again. Um, but, you know, I think we've got to look through this and say that over uh, until a vaccine is developed, you know, th this is the reality of life. Activity will be restricted. And I think you can safely say that from a global economic perspective, economic growth is going to be below potential or subpar um, over that period. Um, you know, people talk about uh, providing or using letters of the alphabet to try and describe what sort of recovery we'll see, V-shaped, L-shaped, whatever. Um, I prefer to think of it in terms of the Nike swirl. Um, you know, you get the sharp slowdown on the left-hand side, and then it's a gradual recovery path over the next 18 months. Um, but I think we can be confident that, well, subject, of course, to a virus that we don't understand. But I think we can be reasonably confident that over the next 18 months, you know, we will get that ongoing gradual recovery, um, not least because policymakers stand ready to do whatever needs to be done to try and re-inject life into business, into economic activity. Um, looking at what is happening in Ireland, um, you know, like everywhere else, there's been a dramatic decline in economic activity. Large swathes of the economy, particularly the service sector, part of the economy, with the exception of grocery retailing, have been shut down. We have over one million people receiving some type of government support at the moment. Um, the government here and the European Union are allowing it. You know, we'll have to accept that over the next couple of years, the Irish government will run significantly higher deficits. That is a fact of life. We've got to accept that. Um, I don't see anything at all wrong with it. In fact, I see it as a very desirable admission or acceptance. You know, we need to run higher deficits to get our economy back on track. The one thing I would be absolutely adamant about is that unlike back in 2007, 2008, fiscal austerity cannot follow um, this economic crash. It cannot. You know, if we turn around over the next couple of years and start increasing taxes, cutting back public spending, uh, you would then risk turning a recession into a longer term depression. That has to be avoided. And I think most governments, even the Germans, um, to some extent, are accepting that fiscal austerity is not the way out of this. I mean, basically, the way we get our public finances back in order over the next few years, in my view, is to reignite economic activity, breathe life back into the businesses that make our economy function, and generate economic activity. And when you generate economic activity, activity excuse me, tax revenues start to flow in, downward pressure starts to come on government spending as less people are unemployed. So it becomes a virtuous growth cycle. That's what we have to pursue in my view. In the meanwhile, very, very strong support will be required and is required for business and for, on, on many different fronts, you know, and for a prolonged period of time. And um, to me, and I, I, I believe this day one, the most important factor, the imperative was to make sure that at the end of this process, when we start to reopen the economy again on a gradual basis, that as many of those businesses as possible that were viable the day we shut down are around at the end of this to rebuild our economy. And if you think about tourism, for example, you know, without hotels, restaurants and pubs, we cannot rebuild the tourism industry in this economy over the next couple of years. It's quite simple. So we need businesses to drive economic activity. And that's why, you know, very strong initial support um, to keep business. And I'll be making suggestions um, towards the end of this about what I believe needs to be done. But as I say, the imperative is to make sure that as many businesses as possible are around to pick up the pieces once we start to rebuild the economy. And I think it would also be a mistake to think that businesses just require massive support now, and that once we start reopening the economy, that support can be withdrawn. Um, I don't believe that's the case because it is going to take some time, you know, 12, 18, perhaps 24 months to get business volumes back to what we would regard as a pre COVID normality again. So that means that there will be an ongoing requirement for remedial support for businesses. It just cannot be withdrawn, as I say, 
um, when the economy starts to be opened up again. Uh, there is a, there's, there's a long path to go through here. Um, one of the things, um, and I think there's many things that stand in Ireland's favor at the moment. You know, the economy was in pretty good shape coming into this. We had an economy um, approaching full employment. And in January, I was writing about one of the big challenges for business over the next couple of years uh, was the recruitment and retention of workers in an economy close to full employment um, with consequent upward pressure on wages. Um, it just shows you the hazards of economic forecasting. Uh, but, you know, the economy was in pretty decent shape. And I think most importantly, um, international confidence in Ireland had been restored over the last decade. We were in a very good place to borrow money again. And that is really, really important because we will need to borrow a lot of money over the next few years to finance the deficits that have to be run. Um, and it's interesting, you know, the NTMA a couple of weeks back um, raised six billion as for 10 years at a rate of 0.22. So virtually borrowing for nothing, that is very, very good. And it just throws my mind back to a debate 10, 12 years ago when people were suggesting that Ireland should default on its debt. Um, I think we should be thanking our stars at this juncture that we did not default on our debt because believe me, if we had done, our ability to borrow to deal with this crisis would be much, much more difficult than it is today. Um, recovery will come. You know, we can be, well, I hate using the word certain, but we can be pretty certain that over the next couple of years, our economy will gradually start to rebuild itself and that rebuilding will be driven by businesses like yourselves out there. Um, unfortunately, just like my comments on the global economy, when you talk about the Irish economy, um, the nature of the recovery will be driven by medical and health fundamentals. You know, so, you know, clearly um, there's, there's not a lot we can say about that other than to watch what the scientists are telling us over the coming weeks. You know, looking at the sectoral impact, and I, I, I say this, um, in, in some senses in descending order, as in the sectors most badly hit at the top and then gradually work my way down. Um, if there's anybody out there that I have missed out on this, I apologize, but it just strikes me that, you know, top of the pile is definitely the whole tourism and travel sector because um, 10.8 million overseas visitors came into Ireland last year very few will come in this year. So tourism is dead for 2020. And even looking ahead to 2021, um, it, it is really going to be a challenge to get people confident enough to fly and to travel again. So for the next couple of years, that whole travel, that serious question mark over it. So within that, the hospitality sector, we've seen the shutdown of restaurants um, up to yesterday evening around 30% year to date. Um, and the, 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 the reality was that, sorry, I, my internet connection may be getting a bit unstable. Sorry, yeah, yeah, Jim, I just turned off your video there because your, your internet connection was going a bit. So I think okay. with the video off, the sound is usually better. Okay, so thanks, try thanks that. That's okay. Much. Okay, yeah, I'll work away. Thanks. Um, as I say, new car sales up to yesterday evening down about 30% year to date. Um, on the 16th of March, just before the shutdown happened, new car sales were running about 6% behind last year. So there's just been a, ma a massive collapse. Construction activity, a lot of it has been shut down. Um, but the one thing you can say about construction, it's already starting to happen. You know, once the construction activity starts to open up again, well then um, construction will come back very, very quickly. The agri-food sector um, in some ways has been a beneficiary of this crisis in the sense that we've seen massive demand for food. But for businesses in the agri-food sector, it is still a very challenging environment because if you look at consumer behavior, um, and anecdotally I'm picking this up very strongly, that uh, people are buying necessities, they're buying relatively low margin stuff, there's not that much demand for higher quality cuts of meat, et cetera. So the agri-food sector is, for once, I suppose, is not at the cutting edge of a crisis, but um, it's still um, a challenging environment. The non-grocery retail sector, 
you know, has obviously um, taken a massive hit with many being forced to shut down. Um, manufacturing activities have been undermined to some extent because, um, you know, a, a lot of manufacturing concerns have shut down, but th they will be able to recommence activity pretty quickly. Then we have the grocery retail sector. Um, there was very strong growth in grocery sales initially um, as people were stocking up and panicking. The food supply chain has held up remarkably well. And what we're now starting to see is that sales, sales excuse me, are starting to decline again, or at least starting to slow down because people now realize that we've built up all these stocks. We now need to start using those. Pharmacy sector, there's been a lot of demand for pharmacy products. Um, but like any retail, any retail business that is still open, you know, business trading conditions are difficult. Social distancing, um, allowing a limited number of people into the shop, it's still challenging. So that's the sort of sectoral impact as I see it. Um, the opening up of all of those sectors, you know, will be gradual. And we see in the front page of the Irish Times this morning, for example, a, a sort of a, a template as to how this might happen. It's going to be challenging. It is going to be expensive for businesses because having social distancing, et cetera, uh, doesn't come at no cost. As I said, in my view, the focus here has got to be from the beginning, keeping businesses alive. There's been a strong focus on paying employees. Um, I believe direct grants will be necessary. Um, I believe um, a much more intensive loan guarantee scheme, heavily subsidized loans, um, a commercial rates holiday for at least 12 months will be essential. A 60-20-20 rent relief scheme, which the French have introduced, what that basically means is that the government steps in and pays 60% of the commercial rent lease. Um, the business pays 20% and the landlord takes a 20% cut in the rent. Some sort of scheme like that. Um, a VAT reduction, particularly in the hospitality sector, um, I think is very important that Adrian Cummins and the Restaurant Association, you know, is calling for a 0% VAT rate for a period of time and then a 9% VAT rate for the next five years. An excise duty reduction has been mentioned by some in the hospitality industry. Um, I'm not sure I would exactly be in favor of that. And I think it'd be a very difficult one anyway from a health perspective to get across the line. Um, the possibility of a gift voucher, I think, has got to be looked at. Um, and what we mean by a gift voucher scheme, it is not lodging a thousand euro into everybody's bank account. It's basically giving every household in the country, and there are 1.7 million households, a 500 euro gift voucher that they have to spend in a bricks and mortar establishment within six months. And if it's not spent within six months, um, the balance goes back to zero. This would actually reacquaint consumers with migrating away from online again and, and getting you know familiar with going into shops. So, and the point I made earlier, so that's just a, a number of suggestions about what I think needs to be done. Some is being done, a lot more will need to be done. But I think the key point I made is that remedial support will be essential for a prolonged period. Finally, just looking at the long-term impact of this, and I hope this kind of feeds into Justin's strategy session that follows this as soon as I shut up. Um, there will be a massive government debt legacy at the end of this but that's not unique to Ireland. It'll be a problem in every country. The only way you deal with that is through promoting economic growth, in my view. Global travel will be slow to regain confidence. There's no doubt about that. Social distancing protocols will remain in place for all businesses until a vaccine is developed. So businesses need to plan for that. Um, I think one thing we saw building steadily over the last few years was the growth of economic nationalism. We had Brexit, we had Donald Trump, both which were sort of pro-protectionist type policies. We have the rise of Viktor Orban in Hungary and a lot more of that around the world. So this growth of economic nationalism may actually be um, exacerbated by what's happening because there will be a serious push now towards tighter borders towards the restrictions on the movement of people particularly, but also of goods. So I think that that is a serious risk that policymakers, global policymakers need to think about. 
food security and safety, I would hope at the end of all of this, Irish consumers and consumers everywhere else will realize just how important it is to have a secure food supply that is produced in the safest manner possible. So I think that is something that Irish food producers really should jump on the back of over the coming years, you know, to highlight the importance of food security and safety. Uh, there has been a significant migration to online. Some people will migrate back, but I, I, I think it's become obvious over the last number of weeks that some businesses really have a good online offering others not so good. So I think there's going to have to be a massive investment and ramping up of online, cap online capability. Remote working, you know, is that going to become a feature of the landscape? Well, I think for some it is, for others it's not. You know, in some cases, all people and businesses want to do is get people back into the office as quickly as possible. But I do think other employers and businesses are discovering, well, actually, remote working is working quite well for us. You know, is there a possibility we could actually allow more people location more often, uh, maybe three days in, two days out, or so, something like that? So I, I think there will be a fundamental reassessment of how remote working works. And I think businesses will look at, will ask themselves the question, do I really need this expensive center city commercial property? So you, you may start to see more office space being vacated because of um, uh, the, the, the remote working thing. Um, and from an environmental point of view, from a quality of life point of view, um, it definitely stacks up very well. And I suppose my final point would be that what policymakers really need to think long and hard about is to prevent this economic crisis from morphing into a banking crisis, which happened back in 2007-8, because once you go into a banking crisis, uh, the rules of the game change, the recovery prospects become much, much more difficult. Um, and I think policymakers recognize that even yesterday, the European Union, I'm not sure it's been made public yet, but they're, they're talking about, you know, a lot of different measures to try and support um, the European banking system to support businesses um, over the coming difficult months. So that's the um, end of what I want to say. Um, I, I can take questions later on if you have any. Um, thank you very much for joining today and um, enjoy the rest of the seminar with Justin. So thank you very much and the best of luck. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, and sorry we had to turn your camera off, but it did definitely improve the audio quality. Um, so we'll bring you back on camera maybe um, for, for, for later on. Um, and please do send your questions in. Remember through the Q&A function, um, through the Q&A button is the way to send your questions in for Jim and indeed for Justin. Um, so I'll bring Justin in there now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnish. Um, I just want to set up to share the screen. So good morning to everyone. Um, and I hope that um, the session that I'm going to go through with you uh, dovetails to, to a good extent uh, with um, Jim's presentation. There's a number of areas where um, we've uh, where, where there's a, a nice uh, crossover. Um, there may be some areas where I might appear to contradict him, but that's not, uh, it, it, it's um, not looking at the likely scenario, which I think uh, was the emphasis of, of uh, Jim's presentation, but more at looking at um, uh, the, the, the fact that um, in forecasting and trying to predict what's going to happen, in, in times of uncertainty, it's, it's, it's particularly difficult. So it's really about thinking of what other scenarios exist out there and then how we respond to that in terms of um, our, our business um, and uh, uh, what it means for, for us uh, uh, having a business and, and, and hopefully in, in some way uh, uh, ensuring that it flourishes. So the session... Um, that I'm, I'm uh, going to go through. I have a, a reasonable number of, 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 of slides. I have more that are available, which will be available on the website afterwards with a little bit more detail. And some of the slides I might go through will be, uh, I, I may go through them a little bit more quickly, but, but uh, it, it's really just to support the point in making 
where you can review in a little bit more detail um, afterwards. So I'm going to be looking at uh, issue of scenarios um, and how, how you use them and, 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 and um, maybe looking at a little bit of the, you know, keeping that radar on in terms of, of as things become clearer, as, as events unfold, uh, keeping that radar on in terms of, of external analysis and then looking at maybe how you incorporate that with an internal analysis and a, 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 in, in terms of response based on the resource and capabilities that uh, a firm has. So um, our previous Taoiseach, um, one of his more famous quotes uh, was, um, sometimes in politics you get a, a, a wallop. And, um, you know, the, the whole country, indeed the whole world, has, has, has received quite a, a bit of a wallop. Um, and one of my uh, favorite quotes comes from the boxer Mike Tyson, uh, where in terms of strategy and, and, and particularly in terms of the emphasis on planning in the classical kind of approach to strategy, he says everyone has a plan until they get a box in the mouth. And um, we, we definitely have, uh, we, we definitely received a, a, a kind of, a virtual box in the mouth. So what um, I really want to kind of focus on today is thinking about uh, the trends that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic and its impact. Uh, thinking and uh, talking around, you know, uh, uh, what you might uh, uh, do in terms of thinking and talking through the last implications and impact of the, of, of the crisis. Um, identifying different decisions that you might take to, to ensure that your business uh, remains above water and build kind of an element of resilience within that um, for the business and to a certain extent uh, for yourselves uh, so that we can continue to, to operate in a business. Maybe not the kind of business you've been in up to now, but um, one uh, um, that looks at the long term. Looks to the long term. The, one of the things about uh, strategy, and it's one of the, you know, I mean, it was already mentioned a couple of times was uh, stra strategy is, is, is almost synonymous with planning. But I suppose my emphasis today is really about strategy is thinking and acting rather than planning. And that's not to suggest that planning doesn't have its place. Um, but I think that the thinking behind planning is often more useful in a more in uncertain environment uh, where there's a lot of incomplete information where you, you know, we, we don't have databases and that related to the future. We need to think about, um, we need to tr try and make sense of the world in, 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 in times of uncertainty with very incomplete information. And therefore you don't actually have the basis for doing kind of very detailed, extensive uh, kind of planning. Um, so, uh, we're really thinking about trying to, to influence the, the future of our business uh, by thinking through the moves you might make within different scenarios. Um, you know, how we can you leverage uh, our resources, our reputation, uh, the relationships we have um, in order to, to get what we, uh, uh, done, what we want to, to do in terms of, of, of changing a business, in terms of trying to make it continue under uh, adverse circumstances and that. So um, it's really about trying to, to deal, what I want to emphasize is more today, but in, in time for uncertainty is to deal with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that, that uncertainty to a certain extent. So we will be looking through a, 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 a number of, of scenarios, building on what uh, Jim has already talked about. And there's a lot of discussion and talk around the different types. And Jim mentioned letters, and I've got uh, some of those as well. I'm not suggesting that they're all, you know, obviously that are all likely, but that they're uh, uh, possible rather than probable. And it's just to kind of think through them. So, <coughs> excuse me, one of the, 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 the points is that Really, when you're looking at strategy in a time of, 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 of a, a, a extensive uncertainty, is that the thinking and the logics that worked, you know, before a kind of crisis is not the kind of thinking that will, might, might apply uh, in, in those type of, of, of circumstances. So the logic of what made a business work uh, before is not necessarily the logic that will make them work in, in very significantly altered circumstances. So just a couple of, of things about scenarios. Uh, scenarios are really about stories about what the future might look like. And um, 
lots of different kind of organizations. I was involved in one many years ago in looking at uh, what Ireland might look like in, in 2022, uh, kind of 100 years in uh, 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 um, uh, the state was going to be celebra celebrating its 100th anniversary. And it was really about what kind of, you know, how, how you know, the influences of, of technology, economic developments, um, the assumptions associated with globalization, that how they might impact and, and lead to very different types of Ireland at that time. And then how the, the public sector would then, uh, re, you know, react and respond in those kind of different situations. So it's really about thinking about plausible uh, alternative versions of the future rather than, uh, you know, the, the plausibility is important in the sense that you want to have some, it needs to be rooted in some reasonable and reasoned sense of what the future might hold. Uh, so they're not predictions or forecasts. So let's say what, 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 what uh, uh, um, central to, to gin slippery was more about uh, kind of forecasts and, 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 and predictions of what are more likely to happen. Scenarios will include uh, that, but it will allow for the limitations of forecasting and try and think of what might happen, what could happen, sorry, rather than what will happen. So it's, they're not really forecasts, but they, they, they can help a, a business deal, you know, become more resilient if they recognize what could happen and have some kind of, kind of contingency thinking in order to deal with it should it arise rather than uh, devoting all the thinking, all the efforts and energy to, to one particular outcome, which if it doesn't transpire, if it doesn't result, then the, the, the business is more fragile and is, is, is less capable of, of, of responding. So it's about trying to explore the opportunities and challenges that might emerge from a, a range of different scenarios. So it's really focusing on what might happen rather than and how, what it would mean if it did happen. You always have to recognize the limits of available information. And we don't have, a, we don't have information about the future. Uh, we try and learn lessons from the past. We try and learn, you know, let's say in, in terms of economics, you know, how can we avoid, uh, based on the scale of the shock, how can we avoid the mistakes of, of, of how governments and that initially responded until the, the kind of late 1930s initially responded to the Great Depression? How, you know, we can avoid the kind of mistakes, as Jim mentioned, in terms of responding to the, the, the financial crisis and, and, and while some of those options were, were the ones that were, were best seen at the time, you know, learning from, from maybe the, some of the assumptions, you know, the mistaken assumptions uh, uh, which informed policies of austerity might, uh, 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 and, and not, not, not kind of um, uh, experience those again. Uh, so learning from that. The last point I'd like to make just in terms of generally oh, in, in looking at scenarios is to try and remain as objective as possible. OK, and, and not, be, not, not, not become overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. And I know that can seem exceptionally difficult, but to try and, you know, uh, uh, not go in completely with your gut feeling, uh, but to, you know, to, to have a, a kind of somewhat contrarian approach, either by talking to other people, or questioning yourself, you know, what, what, what's making me think that? Why do I, why am I being, you know, uh, 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 been you know, as optimistic as I am or pessimistic as I am. So just trying to, to use information um, uh, 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 as much as possible and, to, and, and reasoning if you, if you don't have information to think, think through, but not, not to fall into that trap of being overly optimistic, overly pessimistic. Um, Jim talked about the different letters and a, a preferred approach, and I'm not contradicting that, but um, there are different ideas uh, about how economies recovered, and the different letters here uh, refer to the, the different um, uh, 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 reflections of the curves of the, in terms of economic activity. Um, and uh, we've got the V, the U, the Y, the W, and the L. Um, I think that the V is, is, is somewhat less likely, and, and the idea is that from a, 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 a management of the virus um, by states uh, is that it's contained within a couple of months with widespread effective testing uh, and maybe even a vaccine, because a lot of talks about uh, vaccine, vaccines but uh, to prevent a second wave, but, and, and that this would lead to a quick rebound of, in the economy. As, 
as we progress, I think that, you know, unfortunately appears less likely. So that's a particularly optimistic one. The second was the U shape, that the impact of the lockdown on the virus is slower, but with widespread effective text, uh, 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 or, and that uh, effective texting takes a little bit longer to, to implement, um, so that we really have a truer, fuller picture of uh, the existence of the virus in the population uh, um, through widespread testing. So, you know, if, if that capacity is built up, and we've seen not just in Ireland, but in other countries, that the ability, you know, in terms of getting reagents and everything else uh, is, 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 is difficult. And a lot of countries have missed their initial targets in terms of having, uh, particularly in Europe um, and, and outside Eastern Asia, have had difficulty in trying to, to um, get the kind of widespread testing that they're looking for. But the idea is that if we do get that, that the economic recovery takes time, uh, but it does take place as confidence um, about containment and then consumer spending kind of returns. Uh, the Y shape is similar to you, except that uh, there's a difference in the sense that some parts of the economy recover quicker, some parts less so. So some parts recover quicker because they're facilitated by, facilitated by remote working. Um, there are more, so it might be perceived by consumers as been more necessary uh, where other areas might take a little while longer for people, you know, uh, 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 to spend in areas where there's greater discretion, less, you know, uh, uh, where there's less of an essential element uh, uh, in, in terms of the consumption. And where, because of different policy responses in different economies, there are uh, a, a kind of a, a, a patchwork in terms of some economies recovering quicker and more uh, in a more solid way than other economies where the policy response uh, in terms of the vaccine, or sorry, in terms of the virus itself, and in terms of protecting the economy, um, have 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 a different uh, uh, impacts. The W is one of the ones that we kind of fear to a certain extent, which is that you have a, a, you know economies that open up quickly, more quickly after an initial recovery and decline in that famous or uh, uh, figure. Um, uh, you know. They, 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 because there isn't uh, widespread testing uh, 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 to the extent that would help us get a true picture of, of, of containment measures. And, um, you know, with the winter time coming or whatever else, it's a reoccurrence of the virus. So then we're in lockdown again. And then the last scenario is really the, the L shaped scenario uh, where, uh, the, the, you know, the, the different attempts to deal with the virus uh, requires. Uh, lockdown measures to be maintained for longer, social distancing to be maintained for longer, that, you know, possibly even leading to, to, to uh, a prolonging of the wave, if not a second wave, um, and that this would lead to a, a difficult and prolonged recession, or perhaps even depression, depending on public policy. And, you know, the extent to which we learn not to repeat the mistakes of the, the 1930s, uh, where, where, where it wasn't so much uh, just fiscal austerity, but the attempt to try and maintain uh, the gold standard and not allow currencies to, to fluctuate and leading to, to a deflation in the economy. So um, I've get provided in the next slides, there are a number of um, each of the kind of scenarios are dealt with uh, just in terms of, you know, the kind of um, the, the uh, how, how, um, uh, it, it, how countries deal with the the uh, health drivers in terms of uh, widespread testing, whether the weather has an effect, and of course the science isn't, isn't really conclusive on that because of the, the, the novelty of the, of the virus. Um, you know, vaccines, we will know. I know in Oxford University, they're already testing with, I think it's 800 volunteers. Um, and that, but it'll be still uh, quite a while before we, we you know, we, we, we really have one. And, and um, one of the Imperial uh, College, people in Imperial College London suggest that really in terms of having something that can be uh, uh, distributed throughout the population, maybe closer to the end of 2021, early 2022, rather than more immediately so that other measures will have to kind of uh, um, be put in place to, do, to, to, con to contain it or to deal with it. And then there's the, the kind of uh, 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 economic and social impacts in terms of, um, you know, its impact on, 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 on global travel and business trade. 
uh, you know, the longer it lasts, obviously home working uh, stays in place for as long as possible. Uh, global travel remains restricted. Economic activity is, 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 is to a certain extent repressed for a period of time. Um, and that depending on how different uh, governments uh, deal with it. So those scenarios are really just to give you a, a snapshot. And these, um, I, I have to point out, come from, uh, it's a nice little summary that comes from ING. It's, they're not something I've, I've created myself. Um, and of course, the evidence and the, the, the evidence and the information behind uh, those different scenarios uh, are, are uh, you know, are more extensively available in, 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 in reports, but, but you know, you can look at Deloitte's and ING and lots of other Copenhagen Economics is another organization that I've been following in terms of, of uh, identifying the, 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 the likely impacts, the different scenarios, the likely impacts, and they have a lot more uh, economic data behind them. Um, so a couple of things to keep in mind is that, you know, one, you've got the different scenarios. Okay, so, you know, in, 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 in using them, you're thinking through, you know, each one. Um, and as a particular scenario becomes more likely, you might focus and, and a, a little bit more on that, but not ignoring the others until uh, circumstances suggest that, they, that, uh, that, that they're less likely. It's important to remember that, they, that, that uh, companies in different sectors will be affected differently, both directly and indirectly. Uh, we've seen the ripple effect uh, even in, 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 in manufacturing uh, 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 companies that are, are less, uh, that where the, the, the demand for their goods are, is less impacted by the, the, the pandemic, but where their supply chains have been disrupted uh, because they're based in, in China or other parts of the world. So uh, Copenhagen Economics, um, I apologize for the resolution, but Copenhagen Economics have done a, a, a study looking at the impact across uh, uh, the economies within the Euro area um, in terms of reduction in activity. And of course, unfortunately, things like arts, entertainment, recreation, uh, hospitality and tourism, where I know a number of you, um, that's the, the sector you're, you're involved in, they have been uh, uh, most severely hit. Uh, things like information and communication, um, working from home, uh, we're entertaining ourselves by looking at, 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 at uh, Netflix and other things are somewhat less affected. Transport sector um, is, 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 is um, in a number of cases, is somewhat isolated because they've been kept, uh, they've been maintained uh, to deal with exceptionally low capacity in some cases, but for uh, vital uh, uh, um, uh, health workers and, uh, and others. So uh, different sectors will obviously be impacted differently. So um, in looking at the different scenarios, you're thinking about trying to imagine what the permanent kind of impacts might be. Um, and the extent to which, you know, the, this phrase that I know some people don't really like, it's the one that, that uh, you know, has got currency at the moment in terms of, of widespread use and understanding is the new normal. So what kind of impacts, what are the permanent impacts? Jim referred to the shortening of supply chains or the regionalization of supply chains and the, the threat of, of economic nationalism. Uh, where, 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 whether it's uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil or Orban in, Tur in, 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 in Hungary, um, um, uh, the orange man himself, uh, Trump in the United States, uh, you know, uh, um, essentially using an abuse. And long term. So we'll come back to the, some of that a little bit later. All right, just, just to let you know, we had a little bit of a, a hiccup there, so I've stopped your video as well to see if that helps the audio. Right. I'm, am I okay still? Your, your sound is perfect now, yeah. That's fine, okay. They, they, they need to look less at me and more at the, the, the screen. It might be a bit more uh, useful than, than looking at my face with an untrimmed beard. But anyway, um, so those are things to, 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 to keep in mind. Um, so, so some of the questions then, uh, for the different scenarios, um, which scenario 
uh, best describes the situation your organization appears prepared for? Better, best prepared for? And now I see all my, my typos. So in the first question, which scenario best describes the situation your organization appears prepared for? And what should, do you need to prepare for? Uh, to maybe a greater extent based on the likelihood, uh, you know, having that radar on, following events and what, what, what should you really want to do? Uh, is, there, is there a scenario that is not maybe very, not highly probable, but possible um, and, and, you know, not, not, not crazy uh, 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 in, 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 you know, to think about that you're ignoring? So is there a scenario that you're currently ignoring that, but you really shouldn't be? Uh, what would you do different in, to survive and, and prosper in each of the scenarios? And, you know, obviously the more optimistic ones might, may be easier to, to, to identify. But, you know, even asking that question and, and, and thinking about it, what would you do differently in each one, in each scenario, in order to help you survive and prosper? And then what kind of resources, capabilities, relationships, uh, business processes and workforce provisions do you need to learn about? So um, obviously, as you start thinking th through these questions, um, maybe identifying uh, 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 um, you know a, a different approach to strategy. You know, in terms of what you might do. You know, what resources and capabilities do you have inside the the, the company, uh, inside the business, to to help you deal with those? What kind of relationships do you have that you know, uh, uh, you can use um, uh, to, to help you with those particular uh, ideas about what you might do in the future. Um, and then how does that impact your business processes and workforce provisions? So there may be a bit of learning uh, to, to do over that or, or thinking about or reflecting them. So in terms of keeping, what I refer to as keeping the radar on, you need to look at um, kind of a, a sense of, a, you know, an element of external analysis. So the important thing to remember with kind of, you know, what I'll, I'll refer to as a pest or pest analysis, which basically looks at the environment, uh, uh, you always have to kind of remember is that, uh, you know, we're dealing with incomplete, uncertain uh, in, uh, information. So uh, you kind of have to keep, you know, especially in terms of long-term trends. And I think it's an, a, a taken for granted assumption that a lot, not a lot of people will still have that they might have had even into the run-up to the end of last year. You know, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And the weather is what you have to deal with, not so much the climate in, 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 in general terms. So um, many of you may be familiar with kind of a, a pest analysis, a pest analysis or a scan step analysis, different terms. And really, I'm not going through the, all the detail of these, but really it's about looking at, you know, what's happening politically that would have an impact on my business, my consumers, our suppliers, where we deliver goods, how we deliver them, um, where you know our, our, uh, where we get our, our supplies, the business services, and and all of that. So it's, you know, from a political perspective, we you know what kind of uh, policies or behaviours uh, are are you know maybe beneficial or helping us. What are more detrimental or or, or a threat or making life uh, uh, more difficult? Um, and and is that likely to continue or change? And then most importantly, what's the implication for the business? So it, 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 it's kind of thinking through the, the uh, alternative versions of, of, of uh, what's out there or what might happen and then what are the implications for us. But the past is really to try and, and get a grasp of what's actually happening now and how certain you can be. So again, the same with economic factors, uh, which ones uh, are, are, are we confronting? What are the impacts on our pricing, on our revenues, uh, by, by each factor, and trying to think through and reason it. And this is where it's, it can be particularly useful to try and talk to other people and, and get, get help uh, to, to help you reason through and to argue with you. I have a client uh, for a number of years now, and as a consultant, I, I don't think I've ever written a report. So anything he's ever received from me in writing has been an invoice. Um, and that, and I kind of mentioned this to him one time and he said, Justin, he said, I don't pay you for reports. 
I pay you, and you'll excuse my language, I pay you to be a pain in the arse to my thinking. I want you to challenge me. I want you to be contrarian. Um, and that means that that's why we, we spend so much time on the phone. That's why we're, uh, 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 when we meet, uh, sometimes over a pint, whatever else, that's what I'm looking for. I want that kind of bit of a challenge to our thinking because he said, I don't want to fall into the trap of being complacent or, you know, kind of uh, uh, viewing the world just from my perspective, but from other perspectives. So for things like a, a, a pest analysis, when you're trying to identify what's happening and how it might impact, it would be really useful to either through your network, to people you know, people you work with in your business, um, whoever you have some faith in that will, will you know, challenge your thinking uh, and your reasoning around the impacts of what's happening and how it might impact your business. Um, in doing that kind of exercise, you might come across a whole range of information and and that and you're looking at you know well we we've identified something it might happen it may happen we don't know so um it's it's good to kind of prioritize so you know if if you think the probability of occurrence is reasonable and the probable impact is reasonable then you're you need to think okay that's high priority that's what we need to to deal with first um you know the less probable, the less uh, uh, probable, probability of impact, the less the probability of occurrence, then you, you, you order your priorities. You know, if it's a low impact and not, not likely to occur, then, you know, on a wet uh, Friday afternoon at half four, when you've nothing else to do, you might decide, okay, that's, that's when we will deal with that and we'll come up with uh, contingency plans, but it's not a uh, priority at the moment. So then to go for a little bit of structure around that. So you're thinking in, in, in looking at your, uh, the implications, identifying, okay, so are we identifying any of the main uh, opportunities uh, in terms of those implications or identifying threats or challenges uh, or, or, or risks uh, in relation to, to those, um, uh, the implications uh, on the business? Then trying to think through what, uh, how might we take advantage of those opportunities or how do we avoid those risks? What options do we have? That is difficult and there's no tool or framework that will automatically kind of help you. Like all these tools, they're, they're really just to help and facilitate your thinking. They should never replace it and they should never override a, 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 a well-reasoned common, you know, common sense. Um, and that so and then you're working out uh, you know in, in, in terms of possible approaches then what are the implications for how we operate as a business so uh, Porigo Canada talked about you know setting that destination and building the bridge to get there and that's really what that's that's um, about so um, in terms of, 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 of starting questions for the scenarios what are your what were your previous expectations and what needs to be rethought? Okay, so that again reflects some of the points made by Porig in terms of, you know, look at, you know, was your business actually going well? Uh, um, you know, where, where, where are you doing, you know, was it, were you doing things the way you really should be? Uh, and that, so, um, you know, obviously all our previous expectations have been upended and we need to, to, to rethink about them. So what are the biggest threats and challenges facing your business at the moment? Okay, so in scenarios, you're thinking, okay, I need to deal with the now, uh, not, not uh, think uh, uh, too far into the future uh, in order to, to, to survive. But when you have space, then you might look at, okay, what might our, the, the, the customers we have or the businesses that you provide products and services to, what might they value in these different scenarios? So whether it's very slow recovery, people are maybe reluctant, you know, working from home, might be re re reluctant to go back at what, um, you know, what do they, what do, do, they, do they really want? Or how do they value the kind of products and services we offer or what we can offer in the future? Uh, and how would they, how, how would that mean, what would that mean in, in, in the different scenarios? What would it look like? Okay. Um, and then what might that mean for different types of customer in terms of what you supply them, where they're based, how you do business. So uh, um, 
obviously you have, have maybe you have different types of customers and you want to look at the implications of each of the scenarios in terms of how it might affect them over time. So maybe younger, I don't know, but maybe younger customers might be more willing to go out and, and, and start socializing um, and that in, in hospitality industry, maybe uh, they, they um, you know, you might have to reorient towards those, those needs. Uh, or, you know, if it's older people, how, you know, uh, uh, um, what you know, uh, in terms of what your business provides, how might they respond, or how do you get to them if the the sense of isolation and and, and cocooning kind of continues uh, in a different version? Hopefully, obviously not as as severe um, as it is now. Um, and I'm I'm thinking when I say that I'm thinking of my own mother who's in her mid eighties, uh, who was very active, uh, extraordinarily active, and and thankfully. Um, you know, uh, uh, have a very studious mind and, 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 and that, um, but uh, is, is, is suffering extensively from, from the, the kind of cocooning process. So continuing with the questions, what new needs or wants might emerge from the current situ uh, situation, but that you might be in a good position to meet? Uh, what does that mean for your current business model? Um, and what are the kind of resources, capabilities, and relationships that are going to be important to delivering you know, if you identify a new value, to delivering that value and, 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 and what uh, changes might you need to make or what capabilities might you uh, develop or, or how might you convert how a particular capability or a particular relationship is, uh, you know, in terms of how, how it has existed before, how might you change that? So uh, there are a number of, 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 of different tools and these are on the slides. I'm not going to go through them, but a number of different tools in terms of rethinking uh, 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 your strategy. This is one um, that um, both students and businesses I, I consult with have, uh, you know, like it's, it's called the strategy content model. But uh, I always find models that ask questions more useful than models that tell you this is what you do. Uh, I'm not a great fan of prescriptive models. So really the only point I want to make about that is that as you're answering the different questions, um, you know, for example, the value creation stages you might be involved in, uh, you might actually, you know, there, there are companies that are considering outsourcing maybe a little bit less because of the vulnerability within their supply chains. Uh, and what does that mean for the rest of it? How what does that mean to your cost base and how you make money? Can you increase the quality of it in order, you know, or, or reduce the price of it in order to, to, to give your uh, customers a different offering? There are other tools like the Business Model Canvas. Uh, this is one that when I go out to businesses, uh, particularly startups or businesses that are looking to reorient themselves, uh, seem to be very familiar with. And I've gone into a number of them where it's up on the wall, all filled out with different ideas and, and, and that. I'm not gonna go through those um, and, and that, but I am gonna go through a little bit around some of the key elements. Uh, it, just to, to think about what, uh, um, how you might respond to the, the different scenarios. So the kind of questions, um, you know, who, who's our existing target customer and who might be our target customer or how has our target customer changed? Uh, what kind of jobs do they want done? What kind of uh, needs do, do they want fulfilled? And then how does your offering actually satisfy or fulfill that need? Uh, not just in terms of, of what's sold, but how it's sold. Um, and, um, you know, in, in small ways, uh, and whether it's temporary or more long term, I know that my local green grocer here in Dublin, and I, it's not a supermarket, it's, it's genuine small green grocer, um, has uh, started uh, a delivery service. Um, and they don't have an online platform or anything else. It's based on sending in an email or whatever else, but they're responding and, uh, you know, uh, uh, to customers, and I've had to isolate myself completely for uh, reasons, uh, for those other reasons, not uh, got to do with the coronavirus and that. And uh, it's been really useful because the waiting list for supermarkets, obviously, for priorities given to older people, is is, is much longer. So um, you're then looking at, you know, in terms of looking at your value proposition, um, and there's a, you know, it's it's really not just the kind of product or service, but the reasons why a person buys something from you based on uh, how they benefit from buying from you 
and therefore you need to think more in terms of, of client needs and what you can fulfill rather than just what services you offer. And it's not to suggest that you, know, you ignore the services you offer, but to really think and, and focus on that and, and what you can offer to meet a, a particular client needs. Um, Obviously, this is implications for the kind of processes and key resources. And I know a number of other speakers, you know, whether it's on, on tax or financial issues or and, and change management and that have been looking at some of the details in terms of how you reorient your business um, and that. But it's really about uh, looking at the key processes, what's absolutely essential for this new kind of value or, or reorientation in, in, in the business and what implications it has for your people, the technologies you use, which may need to be expanded um, if you have the potential for offering a, a greater um, online offering. Uh, that, that's not a solution to so many businesses. Uh, the kind of equipment, information channels, uh, and the relationships and partners you have, and whether it's with banks, funders, government agencies, organizations like ISME, um, whole, you know, people who can help you achieve what you need to achieve on, in, on a kind of mutual beneficial basis. So uh, again, I've broken down these into a number of questions. I'm not gonna go through them in, in great detail, but just, you know, who do you create value? Looking at things like how, uh, you know, uh, what customers really want, how, what are they really truly willing to pay for? How do they pay for it? You know, what do they pay for now? How do they pay for it? How might they prefer to pay? So a lot of the revolution in, in terms of business models, you know, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of them are associated with, with online businesses, but they have revolutionized, you know, the, the typical kind of, you know, asset-based, asset-sale-based uh, 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 business model. So it's thinking about different ways in which people uh, pay for things. Up until recently, I used to, you know, um, I didn't have a, I, I wasn't using my own car. I didn't have a car for a good number of years and I was using Go Car in Dublin. Um, and that, because I wasn't traveling down the country. Now I've had to change that, but you know, the idea of just pay as you go is particularly useful in, in, in terms of cars. We've seen the success of, you know, urban bike schemes and, and things like that. So people pay for things in, 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 in different ways. Um, and that, uh, what value do you de deliver to people? What kind of problems do you solve? And not just what, what you can, what you deliver, what you, what, what, what you solve at the moment, but what you can based on the kind of resource and capabilities that you have. Uh, what kind of relationships do you have with customers? Or what kind of relationships do you want to establish and maintain with them? Um, and, and then with you, and that's where, you know, you, you know, you really need to talk and not just in terms of using all the data and, and, and that, you know, tools that are available, but really, uh, uh, you know, it tends to be quantitative and somewhat reductivist, but relationships are not quantitative, they're qualitative. So really trying to get inside the mind of, 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 of customers is, is if, if possible, is really useful. Thinking about the channels you use to reach customers, whether it's to make them aware of your product, help them evaluate it, um, you know, getting it to them. All of those, uh, uh, you know, can, can need to be considered. And what options you have for, for reaching them uh, now. So there's just some examples um, in terms of uh, the, the um, value propositions, kind of generic ones. So again, looking at the kind of the partnerships and relationships that are vital to you in order to provide value to customers, what kind of support you can expect from them, whether that's from insurance companies, banks, other businesses, uh, suppliers, you know, uh, even customers, especially in a B2B situation. Um, and, 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 you know, public authorities with a local enterprise Ireland or, or um, uh, you know, wherever supports are, are, are coming from. What alternatives? Uh, do you have if th those partnerships can't uh, support you? What you know, uh, uh, ones might you need to develop? And then, really, you're looking. You know, it comes down to looking at what are the key activity resources, resources and capabilities to the current business. And then, really, examining. You know, how can we use these for other purposes? So, a lot of the time, people kind of look at. There's, it's what's called generally referred to as the market-based view which is what are our competitors doing, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, what's the structure of the market, is there lots of competition, is it, 
you know, is the industry or sector concentrated in a couple of hands or is it very fragmented and diverse? And a lot of that, you know, that, that's, that's useful to do and it has its place. But really, the success of a business is not based on what others are doing. It's based on a unique proposition that you can develop based on your capabilities. So it's kind of referred to as the resource-based view or the inside-out approach strategy, where you're looking at, okay, what, based on the resources and the capabilities, what we're good at, our reputation and so on, what, what are we really good at? What, you know, how are we different from our rivals? How are we different from what's out there? And how can we reconfigure and use that to do business differently as the, the environment unfolds? So that refers to things like relationships, reputation. And, and one of the great things, you know, with a lot of businesses, small and large, we see a lot of companies not necessarily motivated by just their commercial, their commercial aspect of the reputation, but wanting to help out and uh, that some of the big pharma companies, I won't name them, but, you know, who've been through difficult times because of uh, some of the decisions they've made and the information they disclosed. And I kind of, you know, see the same names now actually uh, uh, making some of the biggest contributions uh, to the effort to develop a vaccine um, and, that, uh, and, and maybe to, to restore the reputation in that way. Um, but the, 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 the guy in the picture there is a guy called John Kay, and he's really, he used to be a, a writer in the Financial Times. He's one of the, the I know he's, he's traditionally regarded as a, an economist, but um, I use him a, a lot in strategy because um, he recognizes that businesses aren't just about kind of making a profit. It's kind of the idea that, you know, of course, like life, you need water, blood, flow, uh, air, and, and food and all of that. And, 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 and they're absolutely imperative in a, in a, in a, a business or in life. And, and in a business, you absolutely have to have profit. It, it, it won't exist without it. But it's not absolutely the fundamental purpose of it. And the companies that, that focus exclusively on short-term profit maximizing uh, tend to lose out in the long term. And the companies that uh, do something really well um, have a longer-term orientation uh, you know, about, where their orientation is not just about maximizing short-term income, if you like, profit maximization, but looking at building long-term wealth and capacity. Um, and, that, and that's one of the reasons why I really like him. But, and I kind of tend to follow, you know, in terms of investment and that companies that, that are oriented that way. But uh, he emphasizes that uh, this idea to look inside in, 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 in the business uh, in terms of resources, capabilities, uh, the reputation, the network of relationships, and using those to um, decide what you can best do to meet needs and wants out there in the market. So uh, in finishing up, and I know uh, um, I could have kind of gone into each of those a little bit more detail, and there is more available on, on the slides, but just to finish up that, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk about resilience at a, an individual level and within businesses and, 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 and that at the moment. Um, and in a sense, you know, now is about managing the kind of current situation you're in to try and, and, and survive. Longer term, it's about observing and learning the hope of emerging more resilient so that you, you're actually able to deal with shocks. I mean, uh, businesses, you know, I mean, in the run up to the crisis, uh, or the break in, in terms of Brexit, you know, a lot of talk was about, you know, businesses crave certainty and they do. But unfortunately, whether you're a state, whether you're a company or whether you're an individual, the unexpected happens. You know, you can see this written about, uh, uh, by Nassim Taleb in his kind of Black Swans uh, book, you know, the, the, the impact of the highly improbable. And uh, you know, this is in, 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 in our lifetime, this is the second major kind of impact shock in the, in, 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 in you know, within a little over a, a decade. Um, and that, so building resilience so that you're not as vulnerable is, 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 is important. Um, uh, Taleb uses the, the idea of becoming more anti-fragile. So it's not just resilience, but anti-fragile. So he says you need, you need, as a business, you kind of need to be like a hydra. Every time somebody cuts off your head, you grow another one uh, to replace it. 
uh, and then you know, now they have to deal with two heads. So you kind of come back stronger and more able. Um, if you think about a boxer, when they're going into the boxing ring, if they only trained and if they only you know, maintained fits and, and, and sparred and never actually got involved in, in a boxing match, they're not going to do well out of it because they're not robust enough. They're not resilient enough. Whereas they need to actually kind of confront challenges in order to become fitter to deal with the circumstances they're, they're facing. So just one or two little, to, to finish, one or two little things. Um, I'm originally from County Cavan, near a, a place called Virginia. I uh, lived in originally, or initially, between uh, Virginia, Old Castle, and Valley Gym stuff. And there's a business in, in Old Castle um, uh, run by the, the Kellets, a family, and they're in their uh, kind of fourth generation of the business now. And initially, when they started out, they were dealing with, um, they built carriages, uh, not the full carriages, but there were, you know, the, the upholstery, the, 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 you know, the, the cushions and all of that, uh, the springs uh, to make them a more pleasurable uh, jaunt uh, on, on, on the roads and everything else. And obviously, uh, Jack Kellett, when, when uh, cars and everything else uh, began to uh, become more uh, 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 prevalent. He knew that his business was, wasn't going to survive. And he, rather than going out of business, he said, okay, what are we good at? We're good at upholstery. We're good at, you know, making uh, uh, springs. We're good at, um, you know, all sorts of leather work and, and mattressing and everything else and that. Uh, but, you know, we've been using that in, in terms of the carriage business. No use anymore. No call for it. Okay. So what can we do? So they looked at, at the different options and he decided to get into making mattresses. And that switch over where initially the old mattresses with the springs and the horse hair, which was used in the upholstery, which was again used in, in the, the uh, mattresses. He, he used, I think, calico bags rather than uh, linens and cottons and that uh, for the initial covers of the mattresses and that. But that company has become Respa. It's one of the largest uh, mattress makers. And I can guarantee, pretty much guarantee you that every single one of you have slept. If you don't uh, slept, uh, sleep on a permanent basis in a Respa mattress, you are probably, you've probably stayed in one in a hotel or whatever else, no matter what part of the world you've been in because they su supply. But it's, you know, rather than going out of business and saying that era is gone, okay, what are we good at and what can we apply it to? Last example is in relation to the craft beer industry. Um, when you think about the likes of O'Hara's who started during periods of economic boom and they got difficult to get traction in the market and they were kind of surprised and, and that. But one of, the, one of the really amazing things about the craft beer industry is that it essentially blossomed during the worst time in the economy. It essentially blossomed, you know, think about uh, uh, you know, the, all the craft beers and craft ciders and all of that, they, you know, they kind of nearly appear, appear to come out of nowhere. And they, but, but they really blossomed post-2008. Now, there's lots of different reasons, like the lipstick effect, where, you know, you've stopped spending on, on you haven't renewed the car, you've reduced the holidays, you're not gonna, going to get the granite top in the kitchen or whatever else, and life can become very, very grey. So you... You, you want, you crave some little bit of spark, some little bit of, yeah, I, I need something, you know, a reason to live, I, I can't wait, you know. So relatively low level kind of expenditure, expenditures like on good craft uh, quality beer, whatever else. You might drink as much of it as the normal stuff, but, you know, and, and it's a higher price, but that kind of seems to be one of the reasons behind it. So, um, but, but an amazing industry that grew up out, uh, it grew in, in, in some of the most challenging kind of circumstances. And then just to finish, and I really am finished this time, the, the last slide. Uh, there's a lot of military analogies used in strategy, and I'm, I'm actually very skeptical of them. And there's been a lot of them actually used again in, 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 in terms of the virus and the, pan, you know, the, the pandemic. Um, and that, uh, but, but a lot of the, a lot of the time they're, they're not really suitable. Uh, you know, we don't kill our competitors, we compete with them, we sometimes collaborate with them, we don't kind of kill them off or whatever. So what I would say is that 
strategy, uh, taking uh, uh, an idea from von Clausewitz, who was a German general, he wrote a book called On War. And he said the strategy essentially, the success or failure of a strategy depends on three things. And um, he says that the, the first one is that there needs to be some kind of kind of logic and rationale behind it, some level of reasoning. So you use information, um, you, 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 you work out what the implications are for the business and um, you, know, you, you can communicate with people and convince people and persuade people, whether it's people funding you like the bank, your employees or whatever else, but you convince them with some sense of, of, of reasoning. And it's not to be, you know, it's not in, in the sense of overt rationalism, uh, but, but you have some kind of logical reasoning there. And that needs to be there to, to underpin and support the strategy. The, the second part he talks about is the support or morale. So this is the motivation. So let's say if you're adopting a new strategy, adopting a new business model, been motivated by yourself, your belief in yourself, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the idea and focusing all your resources, not kind of compromising and spreading them all over the place so you don't achieve anything effectively, but that you focus your resources on a particular decision and that you get other people passionate and persuade them to that, that, that this, is, this is what's necessary. Now, when John Clausewitz was talking about support and morale, you know, he was talking about the kind of things that has to make soldiers, you know, go over the... The, the the top of the trenches and face gunfire whatever else but that they were willing to do it you know uh, uh and that uh, even if they, it didn't look nice or it didn't you know wasn't something that was positive but you know where their own lives were in danger but just a sense that people will actually act and behave in a way that supports it and without that without some sense of drive or purpose and and that your, your strategy is, is, isn't going to be successful but the third element and this is really important is that no strategy is imperfectible. You will never know whether something is going to work or not. And luck, which is not, and if you look at any textbook, they don't talk about luck, they don't talk about chance. Luck and chance is a huge, has a huge impact, even on the, on the most successful businesses. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, whether it's the likes of the biographies by jobs or whatever else, they, you know, they often underestimate luck. Uh, and the role it played in, the, in their success. Luck and chance has a huge element, plays a huge element. And we only can recognize that after the event. So the reason I'm mentioning this is that the strategy may not work, but you cannot invest, and Paragol Knaif said this as well, you and your business are different. You cannot invest yourself completely in, in terms of defining yourself as whether the, 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 a new strategy, something you experiment, whether it worked or not, okay? You must recognize that there are forces, animal spirits is what Keynes referred to them as, that may, that will, deter, that will have their role in determining whether what you works does or doesn't. And there, if it works, fantastic. Recognize in, in, you know, in, in, in that, 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 that you, you you know, you make good decisions, but also that you are supported by a bit of luck. If it fails equally, you, you know, you had a rationale, you had support, if it didn't work out, but it isn't necessarily got to do with you. That luck may have played its part. Timing may have played its part. And, and, and that if it fails, that you don't let that become your identity. Uh, we, we have to recognize that people will fail. But instead of being hard on them, or instead of looking at them, you know, we will have a greater sense of admiration for people who tried something because so many people, you know, through difficult circumstances will be trying things and some will work and some won't. So whatever your strategy, you know, and I, I seriously wish you the best of luck in dealing with all the challenges that you have to deal with, but remember, not not to not to let it be a reflection just completely of who you are and 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 and, and that remember that so with that i'll finish uh i went slightly over my a lot of time of 12 o'clock so i'll open up for uh questions or more probably for for jim as well okay That's super justin thank you so much and no your your timing is perfect it's it's no problem at all um 
if uh, I, we might actually get you to turn your videos back on because now that we're not screen sharing they might be okay uh, and Jim as well if you're if you're with us because we have um, a few questions that um, for, for each of you and um, for both of you um, I don't actually have uh, I can't start the video just to say oh I have to ask you sorry right, okay. no, sorry. here we go that's fine there we go it's just because I knocked you off Okay, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. And I think the two talks really dovetailed nicely. Um, so Jim kind of taking that macro level picture and then, and then you filtering that down into the implications for businesses and what they can do. Um, so first off, we've, we've um, a question for you, Jim. Um, and Aoife is just asking um, what your opinion is in terms of the VAT for retail. Um, do you think that that might change um, during the recovery period as 23% is very high? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's unlikely you will get a uniform across the road cut in the VAT rate. Um, I, I think they're more likely to be more sector specific. So, for example, um, you might get a, a reintroduction of what they did for the hospitality sector. Okay, um, Having an overall cut in the 23% VAT rate for everything where it applies, I, I think is unlikely because at the end of the day, what they're going to have to sit down and do is, okay, accept that resources are going to be incredibly scarce over the next few years, accept that at the moment there are massive um, requests coming into government from all sectors about what they'd like to see done for their sector. So they're going to have to look at it on a cost-benefit analysis. They're going to have to look at what's possible, allocating scarce resources to achieve the best outcomes. And I'd be surprised if a cut in the 23% VAT rate um, across the board was part of that. Um, I think they would deem it too expensive and it wouldn't be sort of specific enough um, to address specific sectors. Um, I, I think what they'd be more likely to do for the retail sectors are the things like commercial rates, uh, rent type scheme. Um, I'd be surprised in answering your question if they cut the 23% VAT rate. Okay, thanks for that, Jim. Um, Justin, as a, a consultant, you encounter many new clients for the first time. Um, oh, actually, have we lost Justin there? He's frozen. I'll try stop his video and see if that helps the sound at all. No, he's been dropped, I'm afraid. Okay, well, we might give it a couple of minutes and, and see if, um, if Justin comes back in. Jim, I might just ask you, um, you know, as in your role as an economist, you're all about looking to the future and trying to, um, to gain insights into the different scenarios and possible outcomes. I suppose, um, you know, talking to people from the course over the last few weeks and even in my own personal experience, um, you know, people are finding it quite difficult, I suppose, to think too far into the future. If you start listening to the news and when are these restrictions going to be lifted and all the possible what ifs, it can get a little bit overwhelming. Um, so I suppose for people who are trying to take it one day at a time, um, and Justin, great, we got you back in, that's super. Yeah, um, right. so this, this is really a question for both of you actually, but I'll start with Jim. Um, for people who are in the mindset now where they're just trying to take it day by day um, and one day at a time, have, have you any advice for them, any practical tips for how to start? You know, they, we have to plan for the future. We have to try and think about the things that we are going to do in our business. Um, but it can be, you know, we can feel a bit like we're standing in front of a brick wall at the moment when we start to try to do that. So any tips or advice? Yeah, well, I mean, one analogy I would use was the Brexit situation. You know, over the last three years, we've been telling, everyone has been telling everybody, businesses particularly, to prepare for Brexit. You look at how it possibly impacts on your business in a whole range of different scenarios, and then what you can do to actually mitigate the risk and make sure you're positioned to deal with whatever um, eventuality arises. Um, I think COVID-19, a similar type mindset is required in my view. You know, you need to look at the different scenarios that are possible over the next few months. So for example, you know, if you're a restaurant owner and you've seen the paper this morning, that by midsummer they're hoping to have restaurants reopened or pubs. You need to think about then um, how will you get from here to there? Okay, what you require, what assistance you require, because a lot of your fixed costs are still there. There's no cash flow coming in. 
So you need to think about that's the immediate piece, the day-to-day -day piece that causes probably most concern. But then you need to look beyond that and say, if I am reopening my business in May or June or July, uh, what are the conditions going to look like? You know, will I have to have some type of social distancing in place? Will I have to restrict the number of people coming into my premises? So I, I think you've got to plan for the reopening of your business and think about what I, I'm using this term. I agree with Justin, it's a horrible term, this new norm saying, but you think about what that's going to look like over the last 18 months. And you really have got to make sure your business is set up to deal with that. So wh whether it's social distancing, whether it's uh, restricting the number of people who come into your premises, whether it's making more use of um, click, click and collect or online deliveries, whatever. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to have to think about how you operate your business. Um, and I know in a situation like this, it's difficult to think that way. Personally, um, I am an SME. I'm self-employed. I have had about 23 presentations that I was due to do over the next few months cancelled. Um, so, you know, I have to deal with that reality and look at other ways of trying to get revenue in over the next few months to be really important. So, you know, for all business, I think it's the same. You've got to think about uh, the new environment and how you're going to cope in it and survive. And I, I totally take your point that at the moment it is like a brick wall, but the brick wall will disappear. You know, we will come out of this. Um, it's just a question of when and how you need to make sure you are positioned as a business to be able to deal with that when and now and how, sorry. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Jim. Um, Justin, do you want to come in on that one or? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, um, in the immediate, uh, really just complementing what Jim is saying, that really the, in terms of fair, the very immediate sense and thinking about, you know, the possibilities of if you can get back up and running, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and what that means in terms of, you know, social distancing and that. The only thing I'd add to what Jim was saying in that sense is really that, that all FD ideas might not come from you. That if you can take the opportunity, uh, you know, whether it's at a safe distance or online or whatever else, to talk to, if you have staff, to talk to them and ask them for their ideas. Um, to talk to customers or people who could be customers or, you know, just from, from that set or, or from friends or whatever else. So that, you know, you're, you're, you're not kind of taking on the, the responsibility and the anxiety of thinking that, that, that you're on your own and uh, that, you know, all the ideas have to come up from you because let's say you're the owner or the founder of the business, you know, and, 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 and that that's the only repository of ideas or legitimate ideas for, for how you deal with these things. Mm -hmm. But to talk to others about, about, about what, what you, you, you know, what, what you're thinking, getting ideas from them and, talking through them, you know, having that almost kind of, you know, uh, in a more informal sense, the kind of the, the what used to be referred to as the bar stool conversation, uh, where, um, you, you know, the more interesting conversations are not the ones uh, where everybody agrees with you, but where they're contrarian and argue with you or whatever else uh, to discuss things. Um, and, that, and, 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 you know, just to think about the other terms and to challenge, you know, maybe to challenge those those assumptions or whatever in terms of what you can can't do in the immediate sense. And then in more long term, the only other thing I'd add is that to to you know, if you can get space to try and reflect on, you know, what you have, what facilities, resources, what you're good at, and sometimes that. It, it, it's, it's not always as immediately obvious at what you're, you know, what you're good at. So, you know, you know many years ago when I was starting out in, in consultancy and because I'd worked in different consulting firms and that, uh, you know, uh, I, I was very much focused, very mistakenly, but very much focused on the kind of the rationale, the reasoning, the reports and advice that I would give a, a, a business. And now um, I, I, you know, because of the conversations, because of the the fact that people said, "Well, no, you're you're better for challenging our thinking," and I haven't written, as I said, I've written kind of invoices, I've written 
kind of you know ideas around what I, I would do for for a business. But most of it's done through conversations. Most of it's done through, uh, you know, getting them to 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 think beyond how they define themselves at present. Um, you know, whether it's you know even my own family, there's a bulk animal feeds uh, a company there. My another brother is a farmer. I have a nephew who's in, in training horses and that. And the impact obviously is is very different for each of them. But it's it's one of the things with my with my nephew is trying to get him to really think what he does. And he'd say, "I train horses." I'd say, "Alan, what do you do?" "I train horses." Okay, but what you do is actually a bit different than that because he deals you know he deals with um, horses that. Uh, have been through uh, a traumatic experience, whatever else. So we keep on asking him, you know, I, I, you know, to try to get him to define what he did, you know, to basically convince the bank to give him the the money. And I, we were kind of, I, I was asking him, uh, okay, can anybody else do what you do? I, I said, like, okay, there's lots of people out there who train horses, but can they do what you do in in terms of the the, the turnaround time? and the ability to get a horse who's mad and won't go near a person who will almost respond to hand signals. He said, no. And I say, okay, so what do you do that's different from others? And even in terms of talking to students, I kind of say, you know, uh, that, that when it comes to things like capabilities, we're not talking that, that, that capabilities can be very difficult to define and very difficult to impart. I often use the example of if you're good at playing a musical instrument, you can tell me how to play, but I can't play based on you just telling me how to play it. So what is it that you're good at that is difficult to impart or transfer uh, to, to others? And is, that, is there an opportunity for a business there that might be different from what you do now or might be, you know, slight orientation? But that's something that you might think about more in the longer term. Okay, thank and you. If, just... if, if you if you're having difficulty getting back up and running, uh, maybe more immediate. But yeah. okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Mary is wondering then, what do you think that particular types of businesses will be allowed to return to work sooner than others? I think that's that's a, a definite yes, uh, Jim, isn't it? In terms of it will be uh, phased. It, yeah, it it is indeed, um, and it'll be totally done on a. A sort of health perspective you know certain activities are riskier than others I mean pubs would be deemed highly risky for uh, spreading infection so they won't open for some time and when they do open I think it'll be under seriously restricted um, conditions um, so yeah it, it, ab absolutely um, the, the the body um, look looking after this at the moment we're drawing up the plan I mean they're basically going through business by business and assessing the risk of reinfection. So from probably not next week, but by the middle of May onwards, you will see just a gradual opening up in restricted ways of certain types of business. There will be a hierarchy and that hierarchy will be determined by the health risks involved. And if you look at what's happening elsewhere at the moment, countries like Denmark, France, Germany, you know, they are going through that process. And that's exactly the sort of template I would expect we will be following here. Yeah, brilliant. And I think, um, yeah. well, like a, a lot of, of what um, both of you talked about today, there's a, a lovely crossover with Mark and Podrick's session last week. And I think Mark alluded to that as well, that document, that European-wide, worldwide plan um, in terms of the phasing. So um, I, I, you can go back, um, perhaps, Mary, and dig out that link that Mark had in his slides as well on the on the kind of approach to the phased reopening um, and uh, oh yeah Mary's actually asking particularly the outlook for universities and students to get back um, well I suppose I can give a little bit of an answer in that one from what we know um, so at the moment for us Mary we're and for pretty much all the universities and colleges there's no um, plan for any exams to happen on campus um, for the current semester. So every all May exams, which would be the normal exam period, are all online or they're using alternative assessments. Um, and in the main, I think it's likely that similar is going to happen in August, or at least there'll be parallel sessions in, in August that we'll, we'll have to provide the opportunity for people to remain remote should they need to. Um, 
um, for August repeats or deferred examinations. Um, interestingly, what, what will be really interesting will be September. So obviously with the leaving cert, um, you know, colleges and universities are going to have to look at the start date for uh, their new semester in September and the new academic year. And it could be that there is a delayed start, I suppose, for any incoming first year university students. But I suppose like everything, all of these things are still um, still being looked at by the, the Department of Education and Skills and groups like HECA and QQI and, and all those bodies are working together and communicating very well, I must say. Um, it's been a sector that has um, worked well together in this crisis to see what are the, the alternatives. Um, do either of you want to come in on that or have I answered that one, do you think? I think uh, just, yeah, no, I, I, one of the interesting things was really just a conversation. So this isn't policy or anything else coming from, uh, 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 you know, on high, but I know that uh, some of the universities, uh, other colleagues in other universities, they're talking about the, that the likelihood, let's say, for an element of social distancing might make it difficult for gatherings of greater than 10, you know, in, limited, in, 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 in uh, restricted circumstances, if, you know, social distancing, and that uh, basically it, 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 they're essentially telling them that, it, you know, over the summertime when all exam papers and corrections and everything else are done and you've done something to regain your sanity uh, after that period um, of time that you might consider and, and uh, you know, get familiar with the technologies and that uh, more than just Zoom for lecturing and that. Uh, because even if, if colleges and that are open, that they, they, the circumstances in terms of how you could be, you know, if you can understand, it might be somewhat more constrained or different, and it's about uh, ensuring that 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 people are are uh, you know continuously planning in a sense on on that basis. Yeah. Um, but it wouldn't be unreasonable, I think, to think that um, it would be difficult imagining, you know, uh, if you can imagine some of those classic kind of lecture theatres in some of the big universities with five hundred students packed in, or like the University of Limerick where I went, uh, where those there was a capacity of twelve hundred people in the concert hall for a lecture. Uh, which was sometimes failed, believe it or not, um, and that 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 return to that might be more challenging within in, in circumstances where we're looking for an element of social distancing, uh, if not as severe or as restrictive as it is at the moment. Absolutely brilliant, thank you. Um, another one for you then, Jim, coming in from Jimmy. Um, so Jimmy is asking, am I correct in saying there's funding available from the government at 4.75%? Is this a fair percentage or should or could this be lowered? No, I, um, I, I think there's a couple of issues there. One is um, a lot of businesses will be very reluctant to take on debt at all in the current environment, okay? Mm -hmm. Some will, some won't, okay? Um, I would regard an interest rate of 4.75% in this type of environment as absolutely extortionate. What has happened in a number of other countries across Europe and indeed in the United States, they have given heavily subsidized loans of zero or maybe up to a quarter of 1%. That's what we have to look at here. You know, forcing, or I won't say forcing, but companies taking on debt in the current environment at interest rates like that, um, I, I just don't think is solving the problem. It's, it's just exacerbating the problem. So in my view, it's too expensive, okay? <laughs> Full stop. Okay, perfect. And I think definitely from the comments and the, the Q&A we've had over the last few weeks, um, I think most of our attendees are nodding their heads in agreement with you because it's certainly an issue yeah. that has been has been raised um, before. Um, brilliant. I'm just having a quick look at, at the YouTube feed here and we've just got one comment in um, from Harshala. So thanks for joining us on YouTube, Harshala. Um, and they are just saying 360 degree feedback involving customers to share the anxiety of the situation is an insightful tip for SMEs. And I think that's going back to the question I asked you about, you know, people's mindset and taking things yeah. one day at a time. Um, and Justin, you spoke to that quite well, that, that importance of communication. Don't carry the burden alone. Reach out to your staff, reach out to customers, potential customers um, in, in safe ways, obviously online and virtually um, to, to get their feedback. 
Okay, brilliant. Um, so look, we're just at the 12.30 mark. So we leave it there on the, the Q&A. I think we've got to most people's questions um, at this point. Um, so Jim and Justin, thank you so much for today's session. You'll see the comments coming in there, uh, thanking you and, and commenting on the, how much they've enjoyed it. Um, and it certainly was fascinating and really, really insightful. Um, a powerful way to finish off our webinar series and hopefully give plenty of food for thought for our participants. Um, so if you'll allow me, I'm going to take just a moment myself to say a few things. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank all of the people who have contributed to this webinar series. Um, Tomas rang me um, not much more than a month ago, maybe five weeks ago, um, with an idea and a team of people came together very, very quickly um, and very, very enthusiastically to say yes and let's make this happen. Um, and we literally put the program together in approximately eight days um, and such was the rapid response from speakers um, and the lecturing team in the Graduate Business School as well. Um, so my wholehearted gratitude to everybody who kind of put their shoulder to the wheel and, and made it happen. You've seen a lot of me um, over the webinar series, but most definitely there is an army behind me um, who have put the, who've brought this together. Um, and it's been really, really wonderful. Um, I had talked last week about an additional um, bonus webinar tomorrow. Um, when it came to people scheduling um, for the different panelists we were talking to, tomorrow morning just wasn't going to work. Um, so what we are going to be doing is recording additional podcasts um, and putting them up on the website for you to watch. So I'm going to record sessions separately with um, people on the areas of issues you've asked me for, um, which are HR, insurance and then also the whole area of mindset well-being and so on so they will be coming onto the website over the next week or 10 days or so um, and we will send you out an email when they're available and um, so those resources and all of the webinars all of the recordings and notes from the last four weeks are up on the website and will remain there so please do go back and revisit them maybe something that you heard today sparked something um, from from a previous session um, and I think there's a, a wealth of content there on the website and it's yours they're your resources to use over and over again and to share with others to share with colleagues um, and friends and so on the other thing I would ask is that you please stay in touch and um, so we heard great news at the start of today's session and um, from Adam and Tomas from Adam we heard that there is funding available for those of you who want to work with a mentor who want to work on putting a business development plan together and you can contact Adam again very simple email adam at isme.it um, and Tomas then told you about the accredited QQI, the cre accreditation um, from QQI that is available through Griffith College should you work on a business development plan. We have a, an, a, a short course that's in SME management um, and we can use the business development plan to help you achieve that award. Um, and Tomas's contact details, again, simple, Tomas, T-O-M-A-S at griffith.ie. And I will be updating the website, um, possibly not today, but certainly hopefully by the end of week. Um, on the course page, you see a little tab called progression and we will update that with all of the information and contact details to access either fund funding or the free accredited award. Um, so really looking forward to, um, to hearing from you again. And this is not um, a final goodbye. This is a see you later, I think for sure. Um, in relation to staying in touch, um, we know that this is a really difficult time and, and we're all in it together. I think pretty much every contributor, as well as those of you attending, have been SME owners um, or managers. So it's been really interesting to see that sense of community come together. Um, it, we've been working on a side project and some of you are aware of this that have been listening because we've been in touch with you um, to try and bring some of these stories out and to help profile the companies um, that are trying to engage with um, restarting their business and rethinking their strategy. So if you would like to work um, with our marketing team on maybe getting some content out there and, and, and some um, promotional material for your business, uh, please do get in touch with me and I will pass on your details. Um, because I think it's, a, again, that sense that I've got throughout this series of that warmth and that community spirit and that support. Um, so let's continue to have that. And uh, please don't be a stranger. Um, on a personal level, I need to say thank you to a few people as well. Um, so my day job, my full-time job, has definitely not been live on YouTube several times a week. Um, I'm the deputy head of the Graduate Business School. Um, but 
as this program has grown and we've had we've over 1300 registrations today um, I have most definitely had to let other things get off my desk and um, and I couldn't have done that without the support of my team in GBS and um, so Anya McManus, Mary Whitney, Neve Brennan and um, Nadia have all been there and taken up the slack and covered for me so that I could work um, on this and, and bring as much content as we could over the last few weeks and they've made my life um, much much easier um, and possibly the person who's made my life most easiest over the last month has been Michael Bosnay, who you have seen a bit of um, in some webinars and he did a webinar himself um, with Emer Hannon which was absolutely um, fascinating and really really insightful um, Michael has been furiously working behind the scenes um, and, and propping me up when I've been about to make some mistakes on occasion and um, so absolutely couldn't have done this series without Michael as well so thank you so much Michael for all of your help and all of your support and guidance and wisdom over the last few weeks and um, so we will leave it there guys it's been a pleasure it's been a learning experience for me and um, and I hope you have gotten plenty of benefits from it too. Um, as I said, we will be in contact with you via email when those additional podcasts are available. Until then, please stay well and be safe and best of luck to you all. Take care and goodbye. Thanks a million, Jim. Thanks, Justin. See you all.